and I want you to be kind of aware of it <laughs> to begin with. And we'll have, you know, I think as patients come up and I, what I'd like to see in the fluorescein conference is instead of having only fluorescenes, we have imaging. Because a lot of times we don't do fluorescein angiograms anymore, and especially with OCTA, and we'll show you some of that. Um, we're not doing it necessarily as much. So we should do, I think, like for the residents, bring in cases that have like OCTs because we can learn a lot from them. They're in a way, they mimic very much what we see in um, um, uh, histopathology. Okay. All right, so some of this is going to be, so, so the purpose of my talk today is kind of to go over things that are important from what your reading was, but the, the, the quiz is really to help guide your reading, and we'll go over the quiz, but, but some of this might be stuff that, like what we just went over, I don't think is in your basic science book right now, right, because it's really new. The, the classification was just published, it's an international consortium that put it together uh, about a year ago, but Greg Hageman is starting a clinical trial and so you'll be hearing more about that because he's going to be trying it in patients who like fit more of an early intermediate AMD. Okay, so AMD is a leading cause of vision loss worldwide in patients over the age of 50. Um, and you know the dry form of AMD is the most common, 80 to 90 percent. But the wet form, historically, before anti-VEGF, was the one that caused quick legal blindness, and still can. Um, now with anti-VEGF, about 40% of patients can be helped. But if we look at long term, there's a gradual decline in their visual acuity. And some of it's from geographic atrophy, and some of it is from, um, well, we don't know. Maybe it's just because of compliance with the numerous anti-VEGF injections that are needed. Um, but the, we still, the, the, the epidemiology is still uh, that the most common form is the early or dry form of AMD, okay? It's more common in Caucasians, so, and, but when we look at Asians or um, even uh, African Americans a little bit, but Hispanics, they can get a form of uh, neovascular AMD that's called polypoidal choroidal vasculopathy, um, it's actually getting a new name too, <laughs> but uh, it's associated with bleeding in the outer retina, hypertension, and it's from these polyps that might be associated with uh, the choroid and this pachychoroid. So I can't tell you a lot about it because honestly, it's confusing to me. I don't think that it's been clear exactly what the distinctions are. So I'm still trying to work that out before I try to spread the confusion. Um, you know, it's normal to have age-related changes in the eye. So photoreceptors um, can reduce their density, the RPE loses melanin, it has increased lipofuscin, which is an age-related pigment. So we don't necessarily see that when we look in the eye, but if we were to do histopathology, we would see these where the melanin granules, instead of having only melanin in them, they're connected with lipofuscin, this other pigment. Um, and then, as I mentioned, the RPE basement membrane gets thickened, and we have in involution of the choriocapillaris. And then early AMD, which can be asymptomatic, you have small drusen, so, uh, or it, small drusen would be under 63 microns. They would be considered normal, but, uh, but drusen that are larger than 63 microns are considered early AMD, and then as I mentioned, the subretinal drusenoid deposits and focal pigmentary changes. And then advanced AMD, we think of the atrophic form, the outer retinal atrophy, but also geographic atrophy, where the RPE is lost as well, and the choreal capillaries, and then the neovascular AMD, which can have a number of different forms. The risk factors for AMD, uh, there's certainly, it, I mean, the interesting thing is that it's so highly associated with genetics, right? Complement factor H is a really widespread genetic variant throughout the population, but it's strongly associated with AMD. Uh, that's, on that's on chromosome one, but also this um, 
HDRA, ARMS2, locus on chromosome 10 is a big risk, okay? Um, and yet, here we, have a, uh, here we have a condition where it has a high genetic predisposition, right? But then people don't get vision loss until much later. So we know there are environmental factors as well, and they can be, well, we think, well, smoking is a huge environmental factor, but ho possibly high BMI and possibly blue light. This is hard to study, and people have done association studies looking at the epidemiology of AMD at different latitudes, you know, based on how much light there is. And, and so it's certainly we can make a hypothesis how blue light could increase <coughs> oxygen free radicals and lead to death of cells and, and, and all that. But it's more of an association study, and, and I don't think we'll ever have a clinical trial, you know, to be able to really uh, study that question. So this is a diagram. This is an example here of, actually, the RPE is up like that. So this is a small drusen, but it's underneath the RPE basement membrane. The, um, there may be, I don't have a, I'm sorry, I, I, I get examples of uh, SDDs, but I don't have like a great example. There's one right here. But the SDD would be up here. If this is the RPE photoreceptors here, this is Brooks membrane. The, the, you have the uh, apical processes, and then you have basal infoldings. And when it's within the basement membrane of the RPE, those are basal laminar deposits. And when it's beneath that, that's where we get soft drusen and RPE detachments. And the wrap, the wrap occurs high up, sort of in the outer plexus, so of the of the uh, retinal vasculature, and has connections to the inner plexus. So at least the evidence to date really suggests it starts in the outer plexus but it has connections to the inner plexus and you get a feeding arterial into this plexus and a draining vein. And if it, over time, it can form a corial retinal anastomosis, but it's within the retina initially. So um, I, think it's how, I think it's actually fun to think about a fluorescein and all the imaging and how much we can learn about what's going on in the eye. So when you inject the dye, right, so where does it, uh, what's the first, I mean, in the eye, related to the eye, what, what's, what's uh, perfused first with the fluorescein? We, that's right, it's because of the uh, ophthalmic artery though, right? So the ophthalmic artery splits, we get the choroid, we get the retina. Sometimes you still see a ciliary retinal artery early because it's really fed by the choroid, right? And then what about what time do you start to see you know, retina picking up fluorescence. <coughs> yeah, 10 to 12 seconds, something like that. Is that what I heard? Okay. So, um, hard drusen are often associated with either RP, loss of RP melanin, right? Or they can just be potentially squished RPE, so you get a little bit of see through. And so, when the choroidal flush, so, so you get the choroid filling, you get the large vessels, the different vessels of the, of the, I mean, the ophthalmic artery, large vessels of the choroid, and then the choreal capillaris. You get the choreal capillaris flush. And usually the RPE is a mask, right? You just get a kind of a, a flush you can see, but then the RPE prevents you from seeing um, like, a, a, like a, an occult choroidal vessel, for example. But if the RPE is missing the melanin, then we're gonna see hyperfluorescence in the choroidal capillaris. So you, we call that a window defect. But you can have different kinds of window defects, right? So if it's only the RPE, the melanin that's gone, then, then you, you'll see the hyperfluorescence early and it'll fade late in the angiogram. So that's like a typical window defect. But if the choroidal capillaris is also gone, then you won't get early hyperfluorescence. You'll have like decreased fluorescence. You might see the choroidal vessels through, and then you'll get staining late. So it, it actually gives you an idea of what's actually going on. Just a fluorescein angiogram, it's pretty amazing. In soft drusen, these are kind of like pigment epithelial detachments, and so you'll see that they're similar uh, to that where you might have early fluorescence, 
it pools, so it stays within a well-defined area, it doesn't extend outside of that area, and then it just sort of can increase in intensity, but it doesn't leak outside the boundaries. Whereas if you actually had uh, coronal knee vascularization, uh, you would have, uh, you have some uh, leakage outside the area, right, the boundaries, okay. So PED is similar to um, um, soft and The ICG, it varies on what kind of uh, imaging you use. If you use a Heidelberg or something with a scanning laser ophthalmoscope, you can sometimes see early fluorescence. But if you use like a Topcon, you may not. And it kind of depends on, or it does, we think it depend on how much protein is within the fluid in the pigment epithelial detachment and whether or not it blocks the, the uh, ICG. Uh, let's see, anything else here? So wrap, you tend to see if it's associated, it's not always associated with the pigment epithelial detachment, but it can be. It tends, if it does, it tends to be in the center of the pigment epithelial detachment, whereas choroidal neovascularization that breaks through the RPE into the neural sensory retina, if it's associated with PED, it's associated with a notch. So it shows up on the edge of the pigment epithelial detachment. RPE tear, so this, these are sometimes hard to pick up, but you'll get early fluorescence that's extremely bright and, and can uh, stay that way. And um, where the RP is folded over, you will actually see reduced fluorescence. And there's like a geographic line. So it really looks like someone just scrolled the RP. And if you look at the OCT, you see that. And then polypoidal choroidal vasculopathy. The best way to really see the polyps are with ICG. So, OK, and then we talked about this already. We have the type 1 CNV. We didn't talk about this. We're going to talk about a called CNV. This is one of my favorite areas, actually, of research. So this is choroidal neovascularization that actually is underneath the retinal pigment epithelium. Type 2 is what we classically treat, right? We treat it with laser in the macular photocoagulation study. We treat it does well with uh, anti-VEGF. And this is when the RP or when the CNV breaks through the RPE and gets into the neural sensory retina. And I'll show you pictures of that. And then the type 3 AMD is the RAP or the retinal vascular anomalous complex. Okay. So these are examples of type 1. And actually this was a patient that really got me interested in initially. So this patient came in here where just a little bit of pigment in, in the, uh, the macula actually had pretty good vision, like 2025. <coughs> this was an infrared imaging. So this was pre-OCT, and I was studying infrared imaging in AMD to be able to detect early CNV. This is another form of infrared imaging, and we don't really use it that much now, but it's where, so with, with the scanning laser ophthalmoscope, um, anyway, I'm going to show you in a second. But this is, this is, these were all of the same visit with the indirect mode, and I'll show you what that is. We saw this strange lesion. One month later, this was the angiogram, and his vision had dropped. And we were pretty sure that we were detecting early CMB underneath the RPE with this indirect mode. So let me show you what it, you know, we've studied a lot of patients, but basically what we learned was that when you have, so, the scanning laser ophthalmoscope, so the Heidelberg, right? So when you, you put light and it scans across the image of the macula and the light is detected back. And what you get actually is you get directly reflected light in a certain optical plane. So it's really good at picking up things like classic or type two choroidal neovascularization that has broken through Brooks membrane and the RPE barrier and is in the neural sensory retina. But when you have this choroidal neovascularization underneath the RPE, then it's not detected by confocal imaging. But if you put a stop, so you prevent that directly reflected light, you use a larger aperture, so you still can get light down to the eye. What gets reflected back is actually from the deeper layers of the retina or laterally scattered light. 
And so you can actually detect CNV that was beneath the retinal pigment epithelium. So we were among the first to really start the, to understand that CNV could exist, but in different planes of the retina. And that's kind of fed into why some of one of my research areas, but we won't go into that. We're, I want to keep clinical right now. So, so this is what the angiogram might show in a cult or this ill-defined choroidal neovascularization where you get sort of early hyperfluorescence and kind of late leakage. And um, so here's another example. And this is a recent patient actually where you get, you just have this sort of ill-defined late hyperfluorescence, but you don't see a nice lacy CNV like you do with classic. The ICG doesn't really give you a lot of information potentially, but look at the OCTA. <coughs> so the so OCTA, does anyone know what that does? Is yeah. okay. Well, it looks at um, it takes multiple OCT images over time and looks at the motion mm -hmm. between them to essentially map out a vascular network. Very good, right. So it depends, it's different than an angiogram because an angiogram is looking at flow. So you have to have actually flow within vessels and, and whereas the OCTA, as Becca said, it, it works on particle motion. So if the particles are really slow or the detection of your OCTA isn't great enough, you can miss CNV, but you can also see without dye this kind of vascular network right here. So here is an example. This is what the this is what the OCT looks like. So we have these softers, and but we have this kind of fluid right uh, in the between the uh, photoreceptor outer segments and the apical part of the RPE. And sure enough, we see an OCT. We see a CNV, which is uh, this is deep. So here, this is the superficial plexus. This is the deep plexus. This is the outer retina, and, and we actually see it really deep. So it's beneath the RP. And that's one that we don't know what to do. I'm posing that we want to prevent, or at least my hypothesis is, that we want to figure out ways to prevent the choroidal endothelial cells from being activate to bind, right, above the RP. But we don't want to inhibit them. We don't want to kill them because we need vasculature to clean out the, outer, the debris in the outer retina and to bring oxygen and nutrients. So that's kind of where my research is, right? I mean, that's what I'm working on. So here's a type two or a classic choroidal neovascular membrane, right? So you see, you see a well, this is not well defined, but you definitely see leakage late. And that's when the, the vessels come above the RPE into the neural sensory retina. And then this is an example of a retinal angiomatous proliferation or type. And you might, what you see are, you see AMD signs. This is a pigment epithelial detachment here with exudates. And you see them in the deep retina. But you also see hemorrhages or, might, or retinal vascular abnormalities, sort of, which, which is unusual. And, and it's associated with an angioma, which you see leaking and here and here. And it's... Um, in the center, you know, it's not at the edge of the PET. Does that make sense? <laughs> Any questions? So we went over this, the errors, but this is an important thing to think of too. There's a way of predicting what the risk of advanced AMD in the fellow eye is. This is pre um, errors, so this is from the errors study, but basically, if you assign point value, to pigmentary abnormalities, one or more druse, uh, bilateral intermediate drusen, and you look at the five-year risk and 10-year risk, you can come up with a percentage, like there's a 1% risk at 10 years of having advanced AMD if you have um, nothing. So you already have risk, right? And then as you increase the number of points, you increase the risk. And of course, if you have neovascular risk, AMD, this is for the fellow eye. Okay, so what's the risk to the LOI? And that was uh, published by Rick Ferris. I'm sorry, I, I didn't, I can get you that if you want to look at it, but it was in um, JAMA Ophthalmology. It was probably archived 
Um, this is a formulation of, this is what it was with ARIDS-1, and they found, we found a 25% reduction in advanced AMD, and a 20% reduction to moderate vision loss. It's like the only clinical trial that has um, been associated with uh, any clinical trial using antioxidants has been associated with a positive outcome. I mean, how many clinical trials have been done for antioxidants in cardiovascular disease, antioxidants in colon cancer, you know, and none of those work, but it did work here. ARIDS-2, <coughs> we don't have the beta carotene, for example, Mike had talked about before, but we now have the zeaxanthine and the lutein, and it's safer. Okay. All right. Just a few things I want to talk about. I'm going to switch gears now and talk about angiogenesis because we're using anti-VEGF. There are a lot of studies, and I'm not going to go over those. They're in your, your basic science book on the macular photocoagulation study, PDT, all that stuff. But angiogenesis, there are lots of growth factors involved in neovascular AMD, but the VEGF signaling pathway is like, you know, the one that so far has been the most uh, studied. And we think about VEGF as being triggered by hypoxia or loss of oxygen, right? And VEGF, the vascular endothelial growth factor, is angiogenic, but what else do, is it? What other, what was it first identified for? Does anyone know? Sir? Okay, but I mean, what other thing does it cause biologically besides angiogenesis? Like a hero, the fetal growth? Yeah, okay, good. And actually, it was described uh, in um, uterine, <laughs> but what, does anyone know what it was? It was a permeability. It was known as vascular permeability factor. And so the way anti vegf works may actually be more to reduce permeability. Although, when you look at OCTA and anti vegf I don't know how many of you went to David Huang's talk, but you definitely saw, at least by OCTA, it seemed like at least less flow, right, in the choroidal neovascularization. So I think there may be an effect on angiogenesis as well. So hypoxia trigger or stabilizes hypoxia-inducible factors, which then translocate to the nucleus, and they bind in this hypoxia research, or uh, HRE, hypoxia something element, <laughs> where they bind and then they help with the transcription of numerous growth factors, so not just VHF, angiopoietins, erythropoietin, that kind of stuff. But it can also be triggered by reactive oxygen species, inflammation, and other, other um, types of stresses that are stresses associated with AMD. And the RPE appears to be the main cell, but the Mueller cells are also involved. Um, and the angiogenesis involves activation, a lot of, a lot of biologic, at, not only causing the choroidal endothelial cells to become activated to migrate, but there are changes over time in the extracellular matrix. So just if we think about how does AMD start, and um, breakdown of barriers, the RPE has, makes up the outer blood retinal barrier, and so we need to break that down to allow uh, blood vessels to grow into the um, neurosensory retina. So VEGF, yeah, there are a number of family members. There are a number of receptors. Receptor 2 is the one that we're most important, or we think about in AMD. And it's hard to study because knocking out, usually we use animal models to knock out certain uh, alleles or receptors and see what happens and, you know, when we stress the animal model. And a single allele knockout of VEGF or its receptors is lethal. So it, it becomes challenging to study it. There are five splice variants. So there's a parent mRNA, and it gets uh, spliced into these factors. So uh, we've looked at macogen is actually is an aptamer that it binds. So <laughs> It interferes with binding of VEGF 165 and probably 189, which is the cell associated. But what we don't know is whether it binds to the part that actually triggers signaling down the pathway and leads to angiogenesis. So the macogen study, which was an aptamer to VEGF 165, and 
found that it did reduce uh, severe AMD. It was not, um, wasn't as effective as like Lucentis or Avastin. And it may be because the binding site uh, where the, the aptamer bound to inhibit uh, VEGF 165 was not actually the part where it inhibited signaling through the receptor. Okay, so I'm going to move on because as I said, there are a number of trials and there have been combination trials. Okay, so this is important. I want to just show that the CAT, which was the comparison between Lucentis and uh, Bevacizumab, it, it found that in two years, it was basically the two, the two drugs were pretty much equivalent, but even with vision improvement in the first two years, nearly half, there, it was not maintained by five years, but nearly half of the patients saw 24 year better at five years. And 15 years ago, before anti-VEGF, all those patients would have been legally blind. So it's, it's been remarkable what anti-VEGF has done. But basically, the bevacizumab and ranibizumab story right now seem to be equivalent in the avascular AMD. What about the effects on geographic atrophy? So VEGF is an angiogenic factor. If you inhibit it, are you going to like knock out the corneal capillaris and other vascular uh, beds that might be helpful to the RPE or you know, to retina? And um, there have been some studies that find that geographic atrophy is increased with monthly injections compared to other treatments. But you know what? It's, oh my gosh, it is so difficult to figure out how to design a study like this. Because if you have an eye that has choroidal neovascularization and forms a fibrovascular scar, you really can't see the geographic atrophy underneath that well. Even, you, you can kind of see with OCT. So, you know, and it's hard to say if that that fibrovascular scar is what led to the geographic atrophy. So it's, you know, the way we're kind of thinking about it is that the evidence most strongly supports that anti-VEGF treatment does not slow down the progression of geographic atrophy. And we don't know if it contributes to it. So that's at least how I'm thinking about it. So now, this is sort of a philosophy that I take with every disease I have. We want to think about prevention, acute care, and rehabilitation. So we want to think about that with diabetes, with AMD. So what's our prevention in AMD? Well, we, the earth's vitamins and the health and lifestyle, right? Don't smoke. You know, people who don't smoke actually can reduce their risk of vision loss from AMD. Acute care, right now we have the anti-angiogenic uh, uh, treatments. And then remember that when your patients start to develop difficulty with vision, and it can be at any stage, even without advanced AMD, it could be that sort of outer retinal atrophy and intermediate AMD, that they can be helped with low vision aids or with see, at least seeing what's available to help them with some of their, what they want to do. Okay. So just take away and your vascular AMD can be reduced by ARIDS vitamins, treated with anti-VEGF drugs. Despite successful treatment, geographic atrophy continues. Geographic atrophy was not slowed by ARIDS vitamins, and there's no treatment other than maybe to avoid high light exposure. Um, and, and we don't know if anti-VEGF drugs actually worsen it. Okay. So um, let me see here. I want to make sure we have time for our quiz. I have a few quick unknowns that we'll just go through. OK, does anyone know what this is? So this is not AMD, by the way. These are lookalikes. I heard it. Excellent. Yes, very good. So you know, you've got the, the hemorrhage that goes through all the layers, kind of. It's like there aren't a lot of things like that. You've got this white thing. And then you see, you know, an obvious um, hyperfluorescent area. And it's, you know, the important thing with this, I think, as physicians, is it's associated with hypertension. And there have been some studies that suggest when you see this, you have an increased risk of stroke. So these are patients that are really important. I mean, we should always be thinking about the overall patient's health. So these are patients that we want to make sure they're being seen by their internists. Um, and 
uh, there may be some benefit in displacing the hemorrhage, but think about where the hemorrhage is. Like if the hemorrhage is here, I mean, it's probably not affecting the vision too much. It's small, you can monitor it. Um, if it's in the macula, removing it or displacing it with an air bubble, that, that can be very helpful. If it's down below though, you know, it, it, I mean, you can, if you're worried about it going into the macula, you can have the person operate, but what you don't want to do is force it into the macula. Okay, how about this? Anyone have an idea what this is? Yes, you are. That would be on the differential. This is uh, autofluorescence here. What would be hyperautofluorescent? And this is, I can tell you this is an older patient. Good. All right, great. So um, there's, it's supposed to be associated with a starry night, which is the basal laminar deposits, but I don't see it that often with a starry night, frankly. Um, and the yellow material may block the early fluorescence and then hyperfluorescence late. And you know what's interesting about these? They can get CMV, but they often, I, I mean, it's not clear that they are beneficial. You know, by anti vision It seems like it, it just, the CNV just is not that active. And the, the interesting thing to me, I always thought it was related to RPE lipofuscin, but it's, it's kind of like, you know, here's the, I mean, we're, this is, this is the photoreceptors, and here's the RPE here, so it's kind of like a PED, I think. So I'm, I think it can be in multiple places. I think that we're gonna learn that there are probably different classifications of adult metalliform too. Okay. Okay, how about this? So let's say this, uh, it's associated with hemorrhage, hypertension, pachychoroid, maybe kind of, this is actually polypoidal PCV. Okay, and this is a, an example of the showing the area of the polyp right here, and we have a sub um, RPE hemorrhage and some kind of exudation above it. Uh, it occurs in males and females. I think when it was first described, it had a, a sex uh, preference, but over the years we realized it's, it really isn't. Um, hemorrhages, intra-brooks, neovascularization. So that's a little bit unusual. Okay, all right. You heard this one earlier. <laughs> this is a 40-year-old man. Yes, right. And what, you know, what is the most common finding we see on fluorescein in, in CSCR? Pardon? Expansile. Yeah, right. It's not the smokestack, right? I mean, a smokestack is great. We look at it and say, wow, yeah, that's great. But it's not the most common thing. So it can occur um, usually without drusen. You know, I will say that it's hard because people who have CSCR can also get it when they're 60 and they can have drusen. So it sometimes it's difficult to distinguish CSCR from other conditions. And the, the thing to remember with CSCR too is that it can be made worse or can recur with even topical steroids, so like people who use it on their skin. And I've had several patients like that who, you know, you sometimes you have to, they say, well, yeah, I do use this thing. They won't know it's steroid because you can get it over the counter. <laughs> so anyway, okay, that's it. Any questions for that? And we can go to the quiz. <coughs> you note a well-defined area of early hypofluorescence with appearance of the deep gray. Okay, so hypofluorescence early, but you can 
toroidal vessels. And then in the late phases, the lesion remains well-defined. It doesn't leak, it doesn't extend beyond the boundaries. The fluorescein stains around the choroidal vessels. So what would you think this represents? D. RPE and corporeal capillaris atrophy. That's correct. So tell me why, Rachel, what your because you're seeing early hypofluorescence. Um, it could be, well, it could be window defect, like the RPE is lost, but you also aren't seeing the bright corporeal capillaris, so they're both lost, but then you still see the choroidal vessels. Excellent. Very good. So does that make sense? Okay. Any questions with that? Good. So PDT, Lucentis, and Macigen share the following. So you can, so we'll go one by one. All were associated with about 40% improved vision after one year trials. All affect angiogenesis. Sure. All interfere with the VEGF signal. No. So upregulate VEGF. Um, in the in BCSC, it says that PDT actually upregulates VEGF. Really? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever <laughs> encountered okay. that, but. Um, that's a hypothesis. I mean, I don't think, you know, I'll tell you what I have read about PDT, and it's all been kind of speculative, right? It's sort of, it, you know, you use, um, um, you get the dye that gets stuck there, and then you have the light that kind of closes off the vessels, right? Um, and maybe it reduces reactive oxygen, that's somehow doing something, but you know, reactive oxygen, it, when it's outside, the cell, it probably is injurious, it's, but for it to trigger signaling, which it can do, it's usually inside the cell, right? So I was never really clear. I'll have to read that. I'll reread that. It's like a one-liner. Right. Just, so, so first of all, A is not true because PDT may be about 11% at best, okay? Uh, all affect angiogenesis, so question on C. They don't all affect in intravitreal. How do we do v PDT? What kind of injection? Because it does require, well, it's not an injection, it's actually intravenous. Right? Yeah. Intravenous. Right. Yeah. Intravenous. Okay, good. Okay, check all that true. VEGF is neuroprotective. True or false? True. Good. Okay, it is. It's a neuroprotective. VEGF receptor 1 functions as a decoy receptor limiting VEGF signaling. Actually, it's true, okay? But in adult, it's probably involved in angiogenesis. And it may be even through leukocytes or, that's where placental growth factor is one of the family members that um, triggers signaling through VEGF receptor one. And what about ILEA? Does anyone know what ILEA is? So the VEGF trap. It's like a yeah, sink for VEGF. It is, right. But it's actually a fusion protein between a domain from VEGF receptor 1 and VEGF receptor 2. So it not only gets VEGF A, but it also gets placental growth factor. And that's why it's thought to be more potent. And I will also mention that there's some evidence that placental growth factor might be more common in polypoidal type of conditions. So sometimes people like to use ILEA um, for polypoidal parietal vascular. Okay. Uh, Macigen interferes directly with the receptor tyrosine kinase activity of VEGF receptor 2. Right, that is not true, right? And that might be why Macigen was not as effective, you know, and we don't know. And placental growth factor is a member of the VEGF family. I just gave that away. True. Okay. The following are recommended for category 2 AMD. Which one? Hmm? Right, and green leafy green vegetables and diet are always good. I recommend that for everyone. But category two, we don't, you know, that might even be normal aging. That's not really considered. Now, does that mean we don't recommend aerates for people who have a family history <coughs> or might have? You know, I mean, there's a, there's a judgment there. This is just based on the evidence from the clinical trial. 
But we have to remember that a clinical trial is over five years. Why don't we do a 25-year clinical trial? It's too expensive, you know? And after a while, things change. In fact, even with the ARIDS study, so this is really interesting, a little historical stuff. ARIDS-1, this is when we were using beta-carotene. That's when that New England Journal came out about beta-carotene being associated with lung cancer. So, you know, things like that, that was only over five years. So, uh, fortunately, they were able to stop enrollment and, and look at the outcomes, but, you know, um, that was only five years. Okay, um, true. So, so, so have they ever been able to study, like, um, giving AREDs to people with genetic variants, like complement vector H or something? So that's a really good uh, question. Um, there has not been a study like that done, but the, I don't know how many of you are, are do, you, do you know the DRCRNet, the Diabetic Research Clinical Trial, Diabetic Retinopathy Clinical Research Network? So it's, it's a network through NEI that um, sites can join and initially started out to do small well, they were, to be able to ask questions about diabetic retinopathy, and it's, you know, we have protocol S, protocol T, you've heard about those, I'm sure, through D, diabetic retinopathy. Well, they're now going to have AMD. So they're continuing the network, but it's not just going to be limited to diabetic retinopathy. And so that is one of the things, so we had a think tank on AMD last year. And one of the ways, I mean, there's really neat um, evidence that complement factor H that might actually interfere with lipid deposits of Brooks membrane. And that may be the way that it reduces the um, um, advanced AMD. Because one of the theories is that Brooks membrane starts to uh, accumulate oxidized cholesterol and seven keto cholesterol. And that that then sort of initiates a process you know, that leads to choroidal neovascularization and dry AMD. And so complement factor H may actually interfere with that. So when you have the, um, the variant to it and it's not working as well, then you end up getting this accumulation. So um, that's one of the studies that I think they're going to try to look retrospectively initially. Because you could data mine the ARID study, right? Go back and look at patients um, and try to get the genetics, you know, if you can identify the patients. So that's a really good question. I hope they do it. Changes in pigmentation within the macula in a person over age 60 is pathognomonic of AMD. It's false, right? Because think of things that CSCR, you can have pigmentary changes, or a lot of things that can be Polyamine has been associated with increased risk of AMD. So, how about CFH polymorphism? Yes. yes. Lower body mass index. Mm -hmm. No. Smoking? Yes. Genetic variant on chromosome 10? Yes. Yes. And what is that? Mm -hmm. Right. HDRA arms 2. Uh, characteristic of a RAP lesion is associated with the PED uh, is the location of a notch appearance on the FA. This would be at the, in the center. It's in the center, right? But what is that? What when you get a notch on a fluorescent angiogram with a PET? What does that make you concerned about? CMB, like a type CMB. Good. What AMD is less common than dry and accounts for about fifty percent of legal blindness from AMD? Well, dry is more common, but wet AMD untreated accounts for like eighty to ninety percent. Correct. So that would be. And then subretinal fluid was associated with better vision after five years of treatment with anti-VEGF than was intraretinal fluid. I think it's in your book. If not, it was in the literature. The answer to that is yes, true. Now, I don't know what's going to happen in the long term, but it has met, made several of us in retina not be as like, oh, we've got to treat this because there's a little sliver of subretinal fluid. And you'll notice, um, okay. so this patient, um, you'll notice this, right? This little bit of subretinal fluid. They have a CALP CMB. Um, 
I'm monitoring her, you know? I mean, partly it's because in the past, well, first of all, in the past, right, before we even had OCT, this would not be a patient, her angiogram didn't show anything that's concerning for CNV. Uh, for CNV. So, uh, but, but because of the CAT study, I'm very carefully monitoring her, but her vision has been stable at 2025 for a while. So I'm not saying that's the right thing. I mean, we taught, we had a conversation, the patient understands risks, benefits, all that, you know, so, but I don't think we really know yet, you know, what the best thing is in these patients with a call okay. Does anyone have any questions? Mm -hmm.